Good morning students. I am Dr. Himani, consultant in oral and maxillofacial surgery. Today I am here to discuss a simple topic with you which is local anesthesia. Okay, I know there is nothing to panic too much. It's a huge topic but I will be going very slowly about each and every bit so that you have a thorough idea about the complete topic today. So let's get started. So what do you think is local anesthesia? The textbook gives us a definition that is a transient loss of sensation in a circumscribed area which is caused by inhibition of conduction pathway and all those big words. So all of that seems very confusing, right? So I'm here to solve that out for you. I have a simple diagram with which I'll be first explaining to you how is the normal conduction pathway and how does local anesthesia stop? So here is the diagram where we can see a nerve membrane, right? So this is a nerve membrane when is it when it is normally at rest. So that is called the resting membrane potential, which is about minus 70 millivolts. But when the nerve has to conduct an impulse across through it, then it has to go into a state of depolarization. This huge word means nothing but an entry of sodium ions. And based on the speed, it's called as either a slow depolarization or to a next level where it takes it on to action potential. So in slow depolarization, we have an entry of sodium ions to a small extent, right? And in that, it takes the nerve membrane potential now to minus 50 to minus 60 millivolts. This happens because the nerve membrane potential at rest is about minus 70. But with the entry of sodium ions, it turns to be more positive and comes down to minus 50 to minus 60 millivolts. But during this stage, the exit of potassium ions is completely inhibited as we can see here. Now, as the sodium ions begin to enter in, a huger amount, if you see with the thicker arrow, huger amount of sodium ions now tend to enter in and get it on to the membrane potential to be plus 40. Once it reaches the value of plus 40, it reaches the stage of an action potential where an impulse gets generated. Now, this is the active stage. Now, as anything which is active needs to come back to rest, the same procedure happens even for the nerves. But how does that actually happen? It happens by inhibition of further entry of sodium ions and now the nerve has to get back to this old resting membrane potential which is minus 70 millivolts. It reaches that value by causing an exit of the potassium ions and then it reaches a state of repolarization. That is it through the state of repolarization which is at minus 60 to minus 90 millivolts it then goes on back to the resting membrane potential. So how does our local anesthesia function in this? The local anesthesia functions by inhibition of the depolarization. It does not allow the sodium ions to enter in. As the sodium ions do not enter in, there is no phase of depolarization. Hence, there is no action potential generated. Hence, there is no impulse to be conducted across the nerve membrane. So I hope students the nerve conduction pathway and how our LA fits into it is clear to all of you. So now I'll move on to the next bit which is the classification of our local anesthetics. The local anesthetics can be classified in various ways. So let's go by it one by one. So first we could think about as a chemical composition. First either they could be an ester or they could be an amide. So what is the difference between an ester and amide? The difference is in the chemical composition and of course the way in which they are metabolized. Esters are metabolized by plasma, plasma enzymes, while amides are metabolized in the liver. So how do we remember? There are so many agents. It's not practically possible to remember which is an ester and which is an amide. But no, I have a small trick for you with which you'll be easily able to remember which is an ester and which is an amide. So, among the esters, have you noticed the spellings of the LA agents? 
if it has a single i in it it is indicative of it being an ester for example procaine but in case there are two i's present in it then it's indicative of it being a amide like for example lignocaine only exception to this rule is prilocaine which is an ester right so any la agent having a single i is a ester while that having two i's is a amide right so i hope that is easy to remember now apart from this based on the form of availability they could either be available in a topical form or as a solution if they are available in a topical form they could be as embla which is 2% eutectic mixture of local anesthetic agent now what is this eutectic mixture it's just a combination of two local anesthetic agents so now let's see which of those two agents they are in equal proportion that is in equal concentration that is 2% of lignocaine and 2% of prilocaine right so that's how it goes on to be easy as a combination of ester and amide so now moving on to the last but the most important classification of the local anesthetics which will be based on the receptors on which they act so they can be classified here as class a b c and d class a is the type of local anesthetic agent which acts on the external surface of the nerve membrane just assume this to be the nerve membrane so it acts on the external surface of the nerve membrane if it is of a class b type it would be acting on the internal surface of the nerve membrane example scorpion venom if it is of a class c category it would be receptor independent that is it does not depend on a receptor to function and last that is class d would be a combination of the above so it could be receptor dependent it could be on the external surface of the nerve membrane or the internal surface or not at all based on the receptor and that would easily be our lignocaine and aticaine right so what is this receptor receptor coming into picture so let's see a small idea as to how does the local anesthetic actually work we have heard a lot of theories i'm sure like can any of you name them i'm sure you would be remember easily if i tell you the names right now so first is the acetylcholine theory next is the calcium displacement theory next is the repulsion or surface charge theory but all these theories are very old now they are not to be believed because the functioning of the la or rather the mechanism of action of la has evolved through all of this it has now finally reached on to a stage where we have two theories in hand which is rather the membrane expansion theory and specific receptor theory what are these two words membrane expansion let's see how it goes membrane expansion for example we have a membrane of size a but it tends to get a little bigger can you see the difference it is of size b now so how does it transform from size a to size b in a simple way because of the entry of the local anesthetic agent it tends to increase the size in order to accommodate the local anesthetic agent when this happens it is called to be a membrane expansion theory right but the most accepted theory is the specific receptor theory specific receptor theory is nothing but the name is giving the clear meaning of it which is specific that is exactly to a point or choosy and receptor is the base to which the agent is going to be attaching so specific receptor in the sense it would go and bind only to a specific site how can we remember that okay let's take a simple example from nature uh, i'm sure all of you would have seen honey bees sometime in your life right where do you think they go and pick on the nectar is it anywhere on the leaf no anywhere on the stem no anywhere on the soil i don't think so it's only at one specific spot which is on the flower so the honey bee is our la agent which is going and binding to the receptor which is the flower the nectar of the flower over here right 
So once it goes and binds here, it tends to go ahead with the function of the LE agent. Now how is it going to bind and go ahead with the procedure? The nerve membranes are usually covered with calcium. It was going to be causing a displacement and then go and bind to the specific receptor that is to the specific site. Now considering the LA is bound to a specific site, it is going to be occupying the space. Once it is occupied a space, it is not going to permit any other ions to come and bind across. So once that LA is bound to a nerve membrane to the receptor, it is not going to allow the entry of sodium ions. So I hope now you remember and understand how the conduction process stops as I had discussed with you in the picture before. Right? So because no sodium ions are going to enter in, no depolarization, no action potential, hence no impulse generation. So this is a simple way in which LA goes and acts. Something like a musical chair. Once you go sit, you occupy the chair, nobody else can occupy the chair. Right? So now the sodium ion becomes the wanderer. It doesn't get a space to go and bind. So it can't bind, so it can't generate the impulse. So that's as simple as a way in which LA functions. Clear? Okay. Now let's move on to another important part of the LA. What is present in the LA bottle exactly? In the LA bottle, we have a lot of agents. We have first a local anesthetic agent. Right? The purpose for that is going to be conduction blockage. So it could be lignocaine, atticaine, anything. Any of the solutions most commonly is lignocaine. So let's keep that as to be present responsible for the action of a conduction blockage. Now, we also have water for dilution. We have sodium chloride in it, which is for maintaining the isotonicity. And we all need something to be preserved, right? It's all a chemical. It needs some preservatives. Like even our fruit juices need preservatives, right? So even here, the local anesthetic agent requires a preservative. And that is your methyl paraben. I'm sure all of you have heard one more word, one more name rather, sodium metabisulfur. Yes. Does it ring a bell anywhere? Ring a bell for confusion. How do I remember which is the preservative and which is the sodium metabisulfur? Let me tell you what sodium metabisulfite is. Then I'll go ahead to explain as to how you can clear that confusion. Sodium metabisulfite is an agent which is present only if your local anesthetic agent has a vasoconstrictor, which could either be adrenaline or else commonly called as epinephrine. Right? Only if you have a vasoconstrictor present would you require an antioxidant of it. Okay? So your antioxidant for the vasoconstrictor is your sodium metabisulfite. If you see the spelling carefully, you don't see any P present, right? But in methyl paraben, we have P for the paraben, right? Can you easily remember that to be for the preservative for the local anesthetic agent, right? Now, why do we need a vasoconstrictor in our LA bottles? Vasoconstrictor is going to be functioning for vasoconstriction. That is, it's going to be constricting the blood supply to the specific site. Why do we need a reduced blood supply? The reason to require a reduced blood supply to the specific site is so that the drug which we are injecting, in this case local anesthetic, it would be concentrated to the specific site. Now that it's concentrated to a specific site, there is low probability for it to be easily flushed away by the blood. So, for example, if there were five people going ahead and doing some work, and two people were coming and beating them away to not let them work. Now, if we don't have one person coming across, so four people can easily go ahead and function. So similarly here, considering that the flushing away of the local anesthetic agent does not happen much, hence a small amount of the drug is sufficient to bring about the anesthetic effect. Also, considering it causes vasoconstriction, so there is less bleeding in the region. So, your operatory field becomes clear. You are able to see clearly and function accordingly. Apart from that, because the drug remains there for a longer period of time, 
it is increasing the duration of action of the anesthetic agent and because you're using a small amount of the drug than what you were using without the vasoconstrictor, you are reducing the toxicity of the LA drug. So finally, we'll just brief that out. Why do we need a vasoconstrictor in our LA bottles? It is majorly to increase the duration of the anesthesia, to reduce the drug toxicity, and also to ensure that we are easily able to achieve a vasoconstriction. As we all need substitutes in life, so do we need a substitute for the LA agent too. And the common substitute is capryl amino cuprinotoxin. Okay, okay, okay. Don't need to get scared. I know it's a big name. So I'll be repeating it two more times for you. So it is nothing but capryl amino cuprinotoxin. So the name is capryl amino cuprinotoxin. I'm sure all of you are always confused about calculating the amount of LA. Those questions always horrify all of you. So let's break that confusion and fear today. So all of you, I'm sure you remember your LA bottles contain 2% of lignocaine. What does this 2% indicate? It simply means 1 ml of the LA solution has about 20 milligrams of the local anesthetic agent. So Let's go on to some of the values right now, which you really need to remember. A plain lignocaine can be permitted in a dosage of 4.4 milligrams per kilogram body weight in a patient. Which means if a patient weighs 60 kilograms, how much would be the LA I can inject in him or her? It would just be a multiplication of 4.4 milligrams into the weight of the individual, which could be in any of your questions. So let's see a normal adult who weighs about 60 kilograms. So the dosage would be around 4.4 into 60, which is about 264 milligrams. The ideal permitted dose in milligrams of LA, which can be injected in a patient, will be around 300 milligrams if it is a plain lignocaine. Now, but this is in milligrams. I need the answer in ml. How do I shift it from a milligram to a ml? We can shift it easily. 1 ml of the local anesthetic agent has about 20 milligrams of your lignocaine. And with our calculation above, we have come down to a conclusion that about 264 milligrams can be safely given to the patient. So it's just a cross multiplication where we go ahead with 264 into 1 divided by 20 which will give us the exact ml of the LA solution which we can inject in a patient. So 264 divided by 20 will get us down to about 13.2 ml. Right? But again, some of the questions come as how many syringes can I inject in a patient and all of that. It's very simple. We usually calculate a syringe to be about 2 ml. So the ml is about 13.2 and each syringe has 2 ml. Therefore, how many syringes can you inject? It would be easily about 6 syringes. Okay? So, a plain lignocaine can be given in a permitted dose of about 4.4 milligram per kilogram body weight. And it's in a 2% of lignocaine solution. So, that would come down to about 13 ml in a 60 kilogram patient. But, now if I have an LA with adrenaline, what is the permitted dose for that? The permitted dose for LA with adrenaline is 6.6 .6 milligrams per kilogram body weight. So how much of LA can I safely give in a patient who weighs about 60 kilograms? Again, the same mathematics, 6.6 .6 into 60, which is going to be about 396 milligrams. But I need the answer in milli ml. What am I going to do with milligrams? I'm going to get it down to ml now. Again, the same calculation. A 2% concentration of LA would mean 1 ml of LA solution contains 20 milligrams of the local anesthetic. And I can give 396 milligrams in this patient. So therefore, the ml would easily come down to about 19.8. You can remember it as 20 ml. And the number of syringes would be easy to calculate as 1 syringe is about 2 ml. So around 10 syringes you can safely administering the patient. 
So I'll just repeat the values once again. The maximum permitted dose of plain LA in a patient would be 4.4 milligram per kilogram body weight. And that would come to a maximum of about 300 milligrams. But if it is LA with adrenaline, then the maximum permitted dose is about 6.6 .6 milligram per kilogram body weight, which should not exceed the value of 500 milligrams. Now that we have two different components of LA and adrenaline, let's take about what is adrenaline in for. That is the dosage and the dilution in which adrenaline comes in. I'm sure you must have heard a wide variety of uh, dilutions. One in 10,000, one in 80,000, one in 1 lakh, one in 2 lakhs. There is nothing to get too worried with this big, big values. In our LA bottles, we have LA to be in a value along with 1 in 80,000. So in a normal patient, we can inject safely about 0.2 milligrams of adrenaline per dental visit. The adrenaline is always calculated based on per dental visit and not based on the milligram per kilogram body weight. Right? But if a patient is having any cardiac issues, that is he is hypertensive or he is compromised on a cardiac system basis, then do you think we can give the same amount of adrenaline to him? No, we will be putting him into a life-threatening situation if we do that. Because adrenaline is going to be causing vasoconstriction, thereby it's going to be increasing the heart rate. So it would put the patient in a state of tachycardia. That is why adrenaline is considered to be an emergency drug. Right? So in a cardiac or a compromised patient at a cardiac level, we do give adrenaline, but in a very small dose. It is about 0.04 milligrams per dental visit. Okay, I know it's too many numbers. So I'll again repeat the one for adrenaline. So adrenaline, the maximum amount of dose which can be given in a normal healthy patient is about 0.2 milligrams per dental visit. While that for a cardiac compromised patient, it will be about 0 0.04 milligrams. Right? So now let's move on to what is the indication and what's a contraindication for giving the LA. The indication for giving a local anesthetic would be to do any of the procedures like an extraction, a root canal, a flap surgery, an orthodontic extraction, going ahead with removal of a retained deciduous tooth, removing of a supernumerary tooth, a wisdom tooth and I'm sure many more reasons to come. So in case you want to remember them, it's very simple. You can just try to remember each of your departments in your dental college and associate one reason to do with it. Like for example, for oral pathology, it could be for biopsies. For uh, in case of an endodontic department, it could be for a root canal procedure. In case of ortho department, it could be for orthodontic extractions and so on. But as every coin has two sides, same as for the local anesthetic. So it's indicated in all of these conditions. But when could it be contraindicated? The contraindication comes in two forms. That is, it could either be an absolute contraindication or a relative contraindication. Absolute contraindication is indicative of a red signal. That is, you will never ever inject a local anesthetic agent in the patient with a certain condition. And what is that? That is bisulfite allergy or allergy to any of the components in the local anesthetic bottle. The reason lignocaine is most popular is for this because it has shown in studies with a minimal amount of allergy or complications to be arising if administered correctly. Okay, so that is why lignocaine is most commonly used. But have you ever heard an ester to be more popular like procaine, cocaine? No. These are not popular because esters are more prone to bring about complications or complications like allergic reactions. That is why amides are always preferred over esters. And that is why they are more popular and commonly administered. But now Considering that we've completed the absolute contraindications, let's move on to the relative contraindication. The relative contraindications, I have a simple mnemonic for you, CLUCT. 
you can remember it easily like a clue city just eat the e and keep the rest there so what does a c stand for cirrhosis l stands for leukemia u stands for uremia c again is there it stands for renal failure and t stands for terminal stages of cancer so i'll repeat it once again it is clue ct and eat the e so the first c stands for cirrhosis l stands for leukemia u stands for uremia c stands for chronic renal failure and t stands for terminal stages of cancer right now i'm sure all of you would have come across this situation in your dental practice that there's a patient who's come with a severe abscess tooth and you've been told that you have to go ahead with the extraction of the tooth you pick on your la and you go ahead and administer you are first given an infiltration to the patient the patient still says he doesn't have any numbness you then go ahead and wait for some time give on a block patient is still saying he's still not comfortable he's still not feeling any numbness or a tingling sensation now you begin to question your capability whether you have given the block well or whether your infiltration is not working and you're all scratching your head off so let's get an end to this mystery too for any la2 function it has to dissociate and the dissociation is occurring across a simple formula which is rnh plus which is dissociating to rn and h plus so let's see how does our la function at a chemical basis in a normal patient when la is being injected the ph of the tissue around is about 7.4 which is slightly on the alkaline level or the base level so at this ph the la is easily able to dissociate into rn and h plus but the dissociation is always constant so a small amount of rn h plus is always breaking into rn and h plus while a small amount is again joining back to form rn h now the rn form is the base form and h plus is the cationic form now when rn is present it is required to allow the la agent to cross the nerve membrane because of the permeability and the lipophilic properties the ion would go ahead and bind but not be able to cross across the nerve membrane that is why we need the rn form that is the base form of the local anesthetic agent so rn now crosses the nerve membrane and enters inside when it enters inside the nerve membrane it requires to be in the rnh plus form in order to bring about the functioning for the la agent that is to inhibit the conduction process so once it has diffused across the nerve membrane it again rejoins back to form rnh plus so the whole cycle occurs very comfortably in a patient when the ph remains to be about 7.4 but does it happen in our all patients yes in all healthy patients the dissociation would be as 75 to 25 percentage so 25 percentage of rn will be crossing across and going ahead and functioning but do you think the scenario is the same in case of an infection i'm sure not the ratio or the percentage is completely topsy turvy in these cases in case of an infection the ph is not alkaline it's not 7.4 the ph tends to rise to a value of 6 i'm sure you all must be remembering the plate that is 0 to 7 is acidic right and 7 to 14 is basic and 7 remains neutral on our ph scale right so when the value was 7.4 it was coming under a basic category but when it's shifted on to 6 it has come out to be acidic the value could be even more that is it could be 5 that is it could be more acidic right now considering that there is a shift in equilibrium from a base to acidic the property of the la to dissociate is now going to reduce instead of it being a 75 to 25% ratio it now boils down to 99 to 1% ratio 
that means only one percent of RNA is able to cross across the nerve membrane and enter inside the nerve. Now, considering only one percent of LA is crossing across, and only one percent of LA is able to function, do you think the LA is going to be effective? No, the LA is not going to be as effective as we see it in a normal patient. So, why do you think we still do extract? How do we extract the tooth in such patients? Most of the patients who come to us come with infections. So, we have to solve their issue. It's a simple way. Either you have to increase the dosage of LA you are giving. That is, instead of giving one syringe, you may have to inject three or four syringes. But do you think it's ethical to go ahead and inject so much amount of LA in a patient? You could be risking him up to LA toxicity. Right? So, we have another solution to the problem. Duration. That is wait. As I say, right? Time heals everything. It's very true when it comes to LA patient in an infection case. Wait for some more time. Wait for longer duration than your usual. Wait 5 minutes extra because it's only 1% of LA which is dissociating across. But because the process of R and H plus dissociating into R and N H plus continues on a slow basis, we can allow small more amount of R and to cross across the nerve membrane and enter inside the nerve and then bind with H plus and become R and H plus. Right? So this binding will take more time. So it's better to inject little more of LA. Instead of one syringe, you can go ahead with one more. But keep in mind the calculation per kilogram body weight as well as the patient's medical history whether he's having any compromised conditions like he's medically compromised with any hypertension or any cardiac issues like a stent a prosthetic valve and many other rheumatic heart fever infective endocarditis you have to see all of those factors in and also try if you can inject an LA with adrenaline as we had discussed the adrenaline will cause LA to be concentrated to the specific site. Hence, LA will be more effective and its duration of action would improvise. So, it's better to wait for some more time for the LA to act in these patients. So, next time you have a patient who has severe infection in his tooth coming on to you, it's better to tell him to wait on for some time, go on slow and complete the procedure. But if you still don't find that effective, only then go ahead with injecting some more amount of your local anesthetic agent. Now, I'm sure all of this should be very clear to you. So, we'll move on to one more bit, which is our LA complications. Seems complicated to you? Sounds complicated? No. As I've given you a lot of tidbit shortcuts, I have a small shortcut even for your complications for LA. So let's first see what are the complications. We can easily broadly classify them into local complications and systemic complications. So let's see the shortcut first for a local complication. That is to the specific site where you have usually administered your local anesthetic solution. So I'm sure all of you can just pen this down. It's a very simple one. A nut helps FBI. As I've repeated, it is a nut helps FBI. So let's see what this whole funny mnemonic seems to be having an expansion of what? A stands for allergy, N stands for needle breakage, U stands for urticaria which is at the localized spot, T stands for tristness, H stands for hematoma, E stands for edema, L stands for lesion developing post-operatively, that is post-injection of the LA solution. P stands for pain or paresthesia. S stands for soft tissue injury. F stands for facial lung palsy. B stands for burning sensation. And I stands for infection. So I'm sure you should all be able to easily remember, but I'll go ahead with it once again so that you can revise it well. So A stands for allergy. N stands for needle breakage, U stands for urticaria, T stands for tristness, 
H stands for hematoma, P stands for edema, L stands for lesion developing post injection, P stands for pain, paresthesia, S stands for soft tissue injury, S stands for facial palsy, P stands for burning sensation, and I stands for infection. Now, let's take it on to the next level, which is the systemic complications. There are only two systemic complications. One is an allergy of a type 1 reaction, that is an anaphylactic reaction, and second would be an overdose reaction. A patient would usually never go in for a systemic complication unless and until he or she is allergic to the agent of the LA solution or you have not administered the LA correctly. What I mean by saying is that I'm sure all of you would have heard your teachers say aspiration, aspiration, aspiration. What is this big whole world of aspiration? Why are we doing aspiration? Aspiration in simple means just pulling the plunger back. Why do you need to pull the plunger back? You're just trying to pull the plunger back to check where are we injecting? Are we in a blood vessel? Are we in a nerve? Where are we? We can't de determine for sure if we are in a nerve or not. But we can determine for sure if we are in a blood vessel. Because if you are in a blood vessel and you are by mistake about to inject there, if you just pull the plunger back, we are easily going to be knowing that there is going to be something called blood entering into the needle hub. And that is a sign of your positive aspiration. And I'm sure that freaks each one of you out here, right? Because blood, oh my god, I'm going to be injecting into the bloodstream. No, 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 no. The fear is created more so that even by mistake, nobody injects LA directly into the bloodstream because of the effects the LA could be causing. And especially if it is with adrenaline, it could be causing a vasoconstriction and it would again go ahead to be patient in a panic situation because of the resulting tachycardia. So, it is always best and safe to aspirate the needle before you have injected it in any position or any place. Once you pull the plunger back and you see air come in or there is a bubble, so you are sure that you are not anywhere in a blood vessel. You can safely slowly go ahead with injecting your LA solution. Now, I am sure there is a rate at which you are supposed to give your LA solution. The rate at which you are supposed to inject your LA solution is about 1 ml per minute. I know, don't panic. Patient really gets scared with having the syringe in the mouth for a very long period of time. But why do you think it is necessary for you to go ahead at this slow rate? The only reason to go ahead at this slow rate is for slow and uniform distribution of the LA solution across the cells. Already when you are injecting the LA solution, the cells are usually tightly bound to each other. They are going to be expanding because they have a solution entering in. So, it's going to be an extra fit in situation for them. So, there is going to be slight amount of discomfort. But if you try to inject the whole of it together, it causes more trauma and damage to the cell and doesn't allow the LA to uniformly spread across. Hence, there is a chance that your LA could not be effective and also it would be more painful for the patient. So, it is better to keep talking to your patient and going ahead slowly when you are injecting your LA solution in your patients. The systemic complication of an LA arises when we have injected the LA directly into the bloodstream. So, but what could this complication arise like? The overdose reaction could be either acting on the central nervous system or acting on the cardiovascular system. If it is acting on the central nervous system, the dosage is usually about 0.5 to 1 point, 0.5 to 4 microgram per ml in the bloodstream. The amount of LA should be about 0.5 to 4 microgram per ml in the bloodstream to bring about an anticonvulsant effect. But in case it has acted on the central on the cardiovascular system, then the effect would be an antidysrhythmic effect. And this effect would usually arise if 1.8 to 5 microgram per ml of LA is found in the bloodstream. Now, what is all this complicated antiarrhythmic and anticonvulsive effects? If it is a convulsant effect, it would be causing a convulsion. So, in the convulsion phase, there are two phases. That is a facilitatory impulse and an inhibitory impulse. In During the convulsion phase, 
the facilitatory impulse is always present at a higher end and the inhibitory impulses are not permitted to function so if we are trying to stop an individual but we are not able to stop him enough so he is going to be going further the same is for your LA agent as in the initial stage of a convulsion stage only the facilitatory impulse is more active while the inhibitory impulses are not so the patient is turning to be in a hyper excited state or a convulsive phase but as everything which goes up comes down same is for the convulsion stage from a convulsion stage when the patient is coming out of the convulsion phase both the impulses are now inhibit that is the facilitatory impulse as well as the inhibitory impulse so that is when the patient first seems to be in a very hyper excited state but then he slowly comes down to a very slurred speech not speaking well very calm very quiet very disoriented and confused so when you see your patient in the dental chair with these kind of symptoms you're bound to understand that you have injected the solution definitely into the blood stream and it has gone and acted on the central nervous system but if it has acted on the cardiovascular system you will be seeing dysarrhythmia that is there will be patient might say he is having a lot of palpitations or we might be seeing a tachycardia on the patient patient will be very nervous will be very scared panic stricken appearance is what you would usually see if you have injected the LA in the bloodstream and it has directly gone upon and acted on the cardiovascular system so friends i have completed on the lecture so i am sure it's been a long one so let's just have a small recap of all the bits which we have done today so first we went on with the definition of the la which is transient reversible loss of sensation in circumscribed area caused by inhibition of the conduction pathway right so then we moved on to discuss as to how the conduction pathway usually occurs with the depolarization action potential depolarization resting phase again so and how does the la act by inhibiting the sodium ions then we moved on for the classification of the la that is the esters with a single eye amides with two eyes apart from that we moved on to the class of LA that is based on the receptors, external surface, internal surface, receptor independent and a combination. Right? Apart from this, we then moved on, we then stepped up to go ahead to see the theories of the LA, Estelle Collin theory, calcium displacement theory, surface charge repulsion theory, membrane expansion theory and the most accepted which is the specific receptor theory, the binding to the specific site. We then moved on to see the calculation of LA. Plain LA, maximum permitted dose is about 4.4 mg per kilogram body weight, while LA with adrenaline is about 6.6 mg per kilogram body weight. For adrenaline, in a normal patient, per dental appointment, 0.2 mg of adrenaline can be administered, while that in case of a cardiac compromised patient, you can inject only about 0.04 mg of adrenaline. Then, we had also gone on to see how how are the conditions or rather where are the conditions where we can inject the LA and where are the conditions where we cannot. So the absolute contraindication was the bisulfite allergy while the relative contraindications were clue CT where you eat away the C sorry eat away the E and uh, then we then moved on to see what are the ways in which the LA acts that is the dissociation across the nerve membrane based on the pH normal pH of 7.4 Safe to dissociate into 75 to 25 ratio, but then in case of infection, the curve varies, the pH comes down to 6, so the dissociation reduces from 9 to 99 is to 1 percent. So, only 1 percent of LA is available to bring about your local anesthetic effect. And then we also saw the complications of LA, which were local and systemic. Local was a simple shortcut of a uh, nut helps FBI. And the last was a systemic complication, which was usually an anaphylactic reaction and an overdose reaction. So I'm sure all of you are able to easily remember all of this. And if you have any queries, you can get back to me. Thank you so much for your time. I'm sure LA would be just a trick away for you now. Nothing difficult at all. Okay. All the best for solving all of your questions related to LA. I'm sure it would be all on your fingertips right now. Thank you.